Donald Trump comes out after the election and he says, frankly, I did win this election. And there's this period of time where it's not clear which way the Republican Party is going to go. And eventually some of the senior senators and others in the party start to come out and amplify questions about the election. What were the stakes at that moment for American democracy, for the country at that time? And how important was the decision that Republican leaders were making at that time? So in that moment, where Donald Trump comes out on election night and almost like seemingly on the fly begins saying, he says, we were on the verge of winning this election. And then he says, frankly, we did win this election. That was an impossibly dangerous moment, you know, for anyone that really understands uh, democratic societies or authoritarian ones for that matter. Um, the reason being, the old cliche about democracies holds true, that you know, in a democracy, the first election is not the most important. The second one is, you know, the one in which people have to actually make a transition or to peacefully give up power uh, to their opponent uh, if their opponent has won. And there was never really any question about Donald Trump's willingness to wreck uh, the institutions of American democracy uh, if it served his own personal and political aims. Uh, and so that's not the type of language that you hear, like elections being rigged or uh, that the election has been stolen, uh, you know, precisely because that is how bloodshed begins. Uh, that is how societies slip into uh, violent uh, conflicts uh, and you know, at the extreme end of its civil wars. Uh, and so I don't think in terms of the potential implications, I don't think there was anything more dangerous. I don't think there was any moment more dangerous than the one that we saw uh, that night. And how important was it when the Republican Party comes out and they start to amplify that? How important was the decision that they were making? There had been a question all along, you know, from the initial moments when Donald Trump declared his candidacy in, in 2015, uh, there had always been this question about how the GOP would react to him and how they would respond to him. And over time, I think to the horror of many, some of whom were Republicans themselves, the party became increasingly compliant with Donald Trump's demands. And so there was always a question about whether or not there was a line that people would just say this far and no further uh, as it related to Trump. Uh, and almost, you know, we saw this with the questions around, you know, Russia and meddling. Uh, and, you know, the, we saw this with the questions around strong arming Vladimir Zelensky and Ukraine and, you know, the impeachment that that generated. Uh, and there always was the question of where is the line in the sand? And I think that moment at which Donald Trump was taking a wrench to the machinery of democracy and pushing the society into what I think reasonable observers saw was a highly volatile and potentially violent uh, moment, that was the final capitulation for the Republican Party. Uh, as you saw, senator after senator and uh, Republican after Republican uh, falling in line with statements that were not only exceedingly dangerous, but fundamentally untrue. So let's go back and talk about that history. And as we go back, one of the first early signs of this um, that we look at in the film is this moment in Iowa with Ted Cruz. And Donald Trump isn't willing to accept that he lost it. And there's multiple examples going back through his life of, of saying things are rigged, everything from the Emmys to Mitt Romney losing to Obama. How important is it to democracy for a loser to accept? And in this case, what was the warning that you see from Donald Trump in that moment and in, in him not being willing to accept defeat in Iowa? If you go back and read the Federalist Papers, uh, the founders, particularly Hamilton, you know, fixated on the potential of people to subvert democracy 
uh, whether through their own greed or their own, uh, the quirks of their own character, uh, but they understood that democracy at its best was a still fairly fragile set of agreements uh, and that people had to remain on board. People had to be uh, uh, in adherence to these agreements in order for this system to remain viable. And so when you look at all of the precursors to the 2020 election and the extent to which uh, there was this kind of self-centered uh, belief that it was impossible for Donald Trump to ever fail, never was there anything that he ever failed at that he didn't think was indicative of the other person's problem, not his own. Uh, and there was no reason to believe that that kind of character was compatible with the presidency or compatible with a peaceful transfer of power uh, at the end of a presidency. Uh, and so, especially if that presidency was, the end of that presidency was a result of losing an election. I mean, what are the implications for democracy if you have somebody like you've just described, sure. Donald Trump, in the system? And, and, you know, to what extent was that a warning? So if you go back, you know, even to the earliest days of the Republic, uh, you know, George Washington uh, was the first and only nonpartisan president of the United States. Uh, and so he's succeeded by John Adams. Uh, and when John Adams loses the election, of 1800, there's a big question of whether he will willingly give up power to Thomas Jefferson, who has defeated him. Uh, and Madison does so, uh, and sets this precedent that has been adhered to continually since then. Which is not to say that we have not had political violence in this country. Uh, we have had a great deal of political violence throughout the history of this country. But in terms of simply the transition from one administration to another, uh, that has been conducted peacefully for the duration of American democracy, for the history of it. Looking at who Donald Trump was and looking at his reaction to losing in Iowa to Ted Cruz, there was never any question that this was going to pose problems. And notably, in 2016, uh, he said that the only, he said this outright, the only way he could lose to Hillary Clinton would be if the election was rigged. Uh, now, notably, he didn't make any complaints about actually winning that election. You know, he made complaints about saying that the, the uh, popular vote was rigged. Uh, but he didn't say that in an election that was tainted uh, by people cheating, uh, that the results would be invalid because those results would seem to favor him in that instance. Uh, and so from the outset, there were observers in 2016, myself being one of them, who said, this person will never give up power uh, in a peaceful fashion. Uh, just it would be inconsistent with everything that we know about this person. Uh, and if this person won a second term, they would not uh, be compatible with the idea that they couldn't run for a third. Uh, and that was at least my estimation of him from the beginning. So that was obvious to you even then? Yeah, I think it was very obvious when you looked at the pieces that of Trump's character uh, and how they conformed to what we've seen with authoritarians in other places. You know, the, the complete self-centeredness, uh, the subjugation of the society to the whims of his individual psychology, uh, the casting doubt on the political processes, the reorienting of the public's trust away from institutions to him as an individual. Uh, most notably, when we saw the speech at the convention where he said, uh, I am the only person who can fix it. Uh, in democracy, at least in American democracy, in theory, uh, the individual is supposed to be smaller than the institution of the presidency. Uh, and here we had an individual who was blatantly casting himself uh, as bigger than any institution in the United States. Uh, and nothing in that reflected the kind of personal or democratic humility that would be required of that office.
So in that campaign, one of the things that we see that maybe you've seen we've seen in American history, but maybe not in recent presidential history, is the president in the crowd and is the mob and is saying, bring him out of here on a stretcher back in the old days, sort of encouraging violence. What is the signal? What does that say when you see moments like that? I think that the the moments in the campaign, from the outset, really, uh, where Trump made the statement about Mexicans being rapists uh, and, you know, the other bigoted, you know, bile that he served up in that initial announcement of who he was and why he was running. You know, the point of that was you know, not simply to cater to people's worst instincts, although it did do that, but to point out that he would not be constrained by any of the rules or guidelines that had heretofore kept people's uh, behavior in check. And in a political context, always the question is, when does this dovetail into violence? And so the overt egging on of his followers and his adherents, you know, to commit acts of violence against people who they saw as outside their fold. Now, that could have been protesters, uh, that could have been Democrats. Uh, in many instances, he directed his uh, anger at the press and people began booing and harassing uh, reporters who were there. You know, I was on the receiving end of some of that during you know, one of his campaign rallies. Uh, and so what this really reflected implicitly was a statement that he was beyond the boundaries that the old system and the old dispensation that had, uh, to his mind and to the minds of his followers, had not worked well for them, was being swept away and that they were going to do things differently. Uh, the people who you were supposed to remain civil to, well, you can punch those people in the face. You, you can uh, take these people out of here on a stretcher. Uh, and metaphorically, it lent itself to this idea that there were two different versions of America, uh, irreconcilable and hostile, uh, and that they were going to take the belligerent approach to people uh, whom they never really viewed as equally American in the first place. I mean, we're a country that has a lot of violence that has had political violence in the past. But when you look at that, I mean, how unusual is it? What do you make of him introducing that into American politics? Or so, not introducing think, to it, but playing on it. What do you make of that? So I think that, you know, the logic of political parties has always been uh, that they, they work as a kind of elaborate set of filters. You know, you can translate popular will into public policy. Uh, but in theory, you filter out the worst behaviors. You have increasingly... Uh, rational and responsible figures at each tier of you know, the party. Uh, and the most volatile elements are going to be, at least in theory, constrained. What was alarming about Donald Trump was he was a person who was steamrolling his way toward the nomination who didn't reflect any of that. It was governance by id, the worst impulses, uh, you know, the violent streaks, uh, the desire to, uh, you know, the, the time for arguing is done, or the time for reasonable discourse is done. Now is the time to punch people in the mouth. Uh, and if you have no check on that, it is, people referred to that as populism. It really wasn't. You know, it was more of a kind of street corner bravado uh, that was passing itself off as a political movement. Uh, and so the further he went with this, the less capable that filtering system was. And you began to see more and more of something that had always existed in American politics uh, and had existed in Republican politics for a really long time, uh, which was a will toward the violent subjugation of people whose uh, citizenship you hold in question in the first place, or whose patriotism uh, you hold in question in the first place. 
when you see the rallies and you see racist groups, nationalist groups attaching themselves to Donald Trump, obviously there's this explicit racial rhetoric that he has. But is there something about also his the authoritarian side of, of who Donald Trump is that is attracting to these groups? Why are they attaching, you know, as um, Roger Stone says, why are they attaching themselves to Donald Trump in, in that moment in 2016? I think that Donald Trump liberated a certain portion of America. And, you know, those elements, you know, the, the hyper-nationalist, uh, reactionary, semi-military elements um, that were kind of floating around in the American ethers, you know, the Republicans had known about these people, you know, for a really long time. Uh, and, you know, for the purposes of retaining legitimacy, those people had to be sidelined, you know. Uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, they began to take refuge in talk radio. And so that was an outlet where you would hear those kinds of opinions expressed. But by and large, the establishment Republicans needed to keep distance between those, those people uh, and themselves, you know, kind of plausible deniability. What Trump did was he went beyond the, the, the wink and nod version of this to an explicit endorsement using the language that was common in these, these arenas. And people recognized that he was one of them or as close to one of them as they'd ever seen in their lifetimes. Uh, and so at the outset, this, the fact that he referred to Mexicans as rapists, you know, even if someone believed that, even if a Republican candidate believed that, or any, even any major American political figure believed that, they would never say it in public. And here you had Donald Trump, that was the first thing he said in public as a political candidate. And so there was never really any question about why those people were drawn to Trump. You know, they saw him as the best hope of translating their paranoia, their contempt, their anxiety, their anger into a political platform and into public policy. In that primary, there's this brutal combat between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, and it becomes very personal. There are conspiracy theories, there are lies. It's a very ugly election. And, and to a large extent, Republican leaders are just watching. You know, They're not getting involved in it. What does that tell you? as they're watching it, as they're standing by the sidelines, that interaction with Ted Cruz? I think Ted Cruz was an object lesson in what the Trump movement could do, even to a fairly reputable, rock-ribbed conservative like Ted Cruz. Prior to Donald Trump's emergence, there was really no question about uh, Ted Cruz's conservative bona fides. But in the midst of that combat in the Republican primary, uh, you saw Trump sweep Cruz onto the sidelines. And really, that was a lesson for the entire party. You know, if that could happen to Ted Cruz, that could happen to anyone. Uh, and even uh, you saw person after person kind of recognize that. You know, Marco Rubio, you know, who criticized Trump during the primaries and even ridiculed Trump uh, during the prim primaries and then uh, has to immediately reconcile himself to Nikki Haley, who uh, criticized Trump and endorsed Rubio, uh, saying that you know, she thought that Donald Trump was was dragging the country in the wrong direction and then accepted a post in Trump's cabinet when he got elected. Uh, and so what you saw in kind of instance after instance was people recognizing that the stakes had changed, uh, that Trump was now calling the tunes, uh, that his followers would rigorously and zealously enforce his will, and that the Trump movement posed a threat to all of their political survival. And I think that the moment that you see this 
most strikingly is when Cruz has to make nice with Donald Trump. And the reason for this is that this was not only a political conflict, but Trump had insulted his father and ridiculously accused his father of being involved in the death of John F. Kennedy. Uh, Trump had insulted his wife's looks, which is far beyond the pale in American politics. And he'd done all of these things, and the public gave uh, no leeway to Cruz for that, at least not the Republican public. Uh, they felt like, you know, these things happen, uh, but this is our person, and you really need to be on the same side as he is. Do you think Republican leaders made a decision about Donald Trump? I mean, why are they silent over that period as they're watching what was happening? I think there were two things. Uh, one is that Republicans were no different from Democrats when it came to underestimating Donald Trump. And at first, he was a curiosity. And he was this figure, a habitué of late night television and reality TV and social media, uh, none of which were weighty forums for public policy debate or, or the thoughtful exchange of ideas. Uh, and so here was this quirky figure who would show up, probably get obliterated in the early primaries, uh, embarrass himself and uh, people would move on from it. And that doesn't happen. The opposite happens. He picks up momentum. He gains power within the party. And then it's switched to, well, if Trump is able to win the nomination, there is this machinery in place in the Republican Party and more broadly in government that will effectively rein him in that we will turn him into a reputable candidate. Uh, and you know, many people believe that on the right. Even some people uh, in the Democratic Party believed that uh, the responsibilities of the office would cause him to mature and uh, become more sober-minded. Uh, and then the final part of it is that there is a long tradition of people saying things in political campaigns that they don't entirely mean uh, or playing to people's uh, worst instincts, uh, trying to give, gin up a crowd to give you the kind of applause that you want. But that doesn't really reflect how you actually see the world. And there was this question, you know, as we wound our way toward the 2016 election about whether or not Donald Trump actually did believe, whether he was a, a uh, skilled puppet master uh, who had this intuitive genius for figuring out what people in his crowds wanted to hear and saying it to them. And then there was the slow dawning recognition when it was too late that he meant everything that he said uh, and that he was a personality that was not going to be reined in uh, that he was never a person who was humbled in the face of great power or great responsibility, uh, and that he would continue with the same sort of blithe, unself-aware rule by instinct that had led him through his entire life. I mean, as they're looking at him, too, you had said that Donald Trump was saying things explicitly that Maybe there had been a wink or a nod to in the past. A lot of people use the phrase, saying the quiet part out loud. As they're watching Donald Trump, what is the party that he is taking right. over? And to what extent had the groundwork been laid by decisions that those leaders had made before? So when Donald Trump emerged, you know, people who observed politics, the people who had a sense of history, uh, you know, thought that he reminded them of Joseph McCarthy uh, in a few ways, particularly in the trafficking of conspiracy theories, uh, the easy way in which he found himself at odds with the truth, you know, lying fluently. Uh, and the thing about McCarthy is, you know, we have this thing we call McCarthyism, um, which really did not begin with Joe McCarthy. You know, McCarthy was simply the most 
visible and most shameless proponent of a set of political practices that existed before he came on the scene. The same could be said for Donald Trump, that the elements of Trumpism, or the things that came to be called Trumpism, were present long before Donald Trump took the ride down that gilded escalator uh, in Trump Tower and gave the announcement speech in June of 2015 that he was running for the presidency. What he did was assemble those disparate elements and market them in a way, shamelessly, boldly, overtly, that people hadn't seen, at least not on that stage of American politics before. And so the GOP had, in the years prior to Trump, seen figures like Pat Buchanan in 1996, who ran the nativist America First uh, political campaign uh, for president. They had seen the increasing reliance upon the politics of racial anxiety and racial resentment. Uh, and that goes back even further to figures like uh, Strom Thurmond, the senator from South Carolina, and Jesse Helms, uh, the senator from North Carolina. They'd seen the none too subtle race baiting of the 1988 presidential campaign, uh, where the George Bush, the elder uh, campaign, uh, produced the ads about Willie Horton, a, a black man who had been convicted of sexual assault uh, as a means of saying that Michael Dukakis, the Democratic nominee, was soft on crime. Uh, and so all of those things were present in the party. I mean, you, you go a generation before that to the 1964 presidential election with Barry Goldwater uh, being the nominee and his opposition to the Civil Rights Act of that year. Uh, these things were not new. What happened was that Donald Trump had a particular talent for marketing them and recognized what their political potential could be, and that he arrived in a moment where those anxieties were uniquely resonant in American society. And the combination of those two things was immensely combustible. But when you look at those, you know, in general terms, can you describe what it was that the Republican Party was tapping into that then Donald Trump, you know, just sort of a list of what you were talking about, just in more general terms? So the elements of Trumpism were not unique to Donald Trump, uh, and they had been present before Donald Trump. Uh, I think the, the talent that he had was in assembling uh, those anxieties and marketing them. Uh, and he did so at a moment that was particularly volatile. He tapped into the fear that many white people possessed that this was not going to be a majority white society anymore. Uh, anxiety around demographic change. Uh, there was a particular kind of anxiety that was associated with the fact that there had been a black president. There was a black man in the White House for the preceding eight years. And for people, many of whom wound up supporting Donald Trump later, uh, it felt as if the world was upside down, you know, in seeing an African-American the, in the presidency. Uh, he was running against Hillary Clinton uh, in a moment in which a country uh, with a long history of sexism was countenancing the idea of it being a female head of state. Uh, and, you know, between the ideas of immigration, the ideas of race, uh, the ideas of gender, uh, a always resonant idea that America had lost its place in the world and was being taken advantage of, uh, that the nation had been you know, suckered and led astray in some kind of way. And he bound all of those things up into a neat bundle of anxiety and marketed himself as the antidote for them. So the, the question of legitimizing Donald Trump the clearest example of the film is Mike Pence, who makes this decision. You know, he appeals to evangelicals and to the sort of establishment of the party. How important is that decision that a Pence makes to legitimize a candidate like Donald Trump? One of the more notable elements of 2016 was the migration of evangelical voters into the Donald Trump camp. 
Uh, there were a number of reasons why this was surprising. Uh, one, he was a New Yorker, not a Southerner. Uh, two, he was divorced uh, twice. Uh, three, he had been a figure of tabloid news reportage uh, for the outrageousness of his personal life. There was nothing that suggested piety you know, was uh, a virtue he pursued in his, his personal life. Uh, and so what was the appeal? Well, the appeal lay in the fact that people thought that he was the best vector to achieve you know, particular goals that evangelicals had sought uh, for half a century, most notably the reversal of Roe v. Wade. But for people who were holdouts, you know, people for whom Trump's personal behavior uh, and his personal uh, lack of Christian conviction, uh, and certainly not in his, his rhetoric or in his uh, public speeches, does he make great reference to uh, his own religious sentiments. The fact that Mike Pence joined the ticket implicitly said that if I can tolerate this man, so can you. Or he lent his credibility in evangelical Christian circles to the cause of Donald Trump. And, you know, political tickets want to serve as much of their coalition as possible. Uh, with Donald Trump, you could say there was a particular kind of nationalist uh, element that was attracted to him. Uh, there were uh, isolationist elements that were attracted to him. There were protectionist elements that were attracted to him. But they really needed uh, the energy and zeal that the evangelical base of the Republican Party would bring. And Mike Pence facilitated that. So many of the Republicans didn't expect him to win, as you said, and, and were skeptical about him. But he does win, and he does arrive into Washington as the president. And they make a decision that they're going to work with him, at, you know, at once estimating what they're going to get out of a deal, and at the other time, you know, further lending legitimacy to who he is as a president. What do you make of that moment of the choice that they were facing and, and of what they decided on how to deal with the new president? Well, there's a conflict implicit in this. Like, people know that Trump is not good for democracy. It's not shocking. People, is not, this is not simply a perspective that people on the left have. Uh, but he's very good for their policy and political interests. From the outset, there was a sense that this person could make transformative changes to the composition of the Supreme Court. And that's high on the list of priorities. And the belief is that you can just reconcile yourself to the parts that you don't like, uh, or there's a downsizing, a minimization of the really dangerous parts of his character and highlighting the fact that this person will allow Republicans to do things that they've wanted to do for decades. And that's the bargain. You know, it's a kind of Faustian deal. Uh, but it's also notable that early on in the Trump administration, you know, there's a kind of give and take, you know, wherein he takes figures from the Republican establishment uh, who become part of his cabinet, uh, who, you know, have you know, central and pivotal roles uh, in policy and guidance uh, of the administration. One narrative of Trump's growing independence and the increasing volatility uh, of that administration is the arc of how many of those people leave in you know, the course of those first two years. Uh, and so on both sides, uh, people believe that there is you know, a bargain. Trump needs this establishment in order to gain uh, the presidency. Uh, and the establishment thinks that they can rein him in enough to achieve their policy goals without doing irreparable damage uh, to the system in, in the course of that. One of the, the biggest events of that first year is Charlottesville. When you look back at that, so many people at the time were surprised by what they saw in Charlottesville. Should they have been? What was the meaning of seeing people marching with torches you know, chanting, Jews will not replace us. What, what was the meaning of that moment in this story about American democracy? 
I think Charlottesville really eliminated any question about who Donald Trump was or what he represented. The reason I say that is all political candidates try to kind of maximize their surface area. They let people see them in the light that is most advantageous. Uh, if I need to be a populist, then with this crowd, I'm populist. Uh, if I need to be a elitist figure of, of the, the country club circuit with this crowd, then I can be that. Uh, and so there had been this debate about who and what Donald Trump was, and therefore what Trumpism was. But by the time you get to Charlottesville, you really couldn't deny that this was a radically nationalist, anti-Semitic and racist movement. Because these are people who are overtly supporting Donald Trump and marching theoretically in a free speech rally but really there to intimidate and frighten people who don't believe as they do. And the demographic anxieties that had been ginned up in Donald Trump's speech at the outset, we talked about that Mexico, quote unquote, not sending their best people here. Well, that's part of this replacement theory idea the concern that white people will become a minority in the United States, which also dates back a century. You can find that's not a new idea, but it's resurrected and given new valence. And these are people literally shouting that Jews will not replace us. Of all the things that you could say about the direction of American politics or specific demands about public policy, or claims that you can make on the government to act on your behalf. You have the microphone, the world is listening. And what you announce is Jews will not replace us? That's your thing? Well, yeah, that tells you this is a movement that is not really concerned with tax rates. Uh, this is a movement that is not really concerned with the fine details of foreign policy. Uh, this is a movement that is built upon a particular kind of racial revanchism uh, and making sure when people would say, you know, make America great again, the kind of derisive rejoinder was, you know, make America white again. And that is literally what's being said uh, at, at this point. There's this conversation with Paul Ryan where he says, you know, those are my people. He doesn't want to distance himself from it. What do we take from that conversation he has with Ryan where he says, you know, he doesn't want to distance himself from my people. I mean, Paul Ryan is a figure as, as close to the embodiment of the Republican establishment as you can come up with. Uh, and when Trump says that those are my people, he's not inaccurate. He knows who has been coming to his rallies uh, and who has been lending support to him. He knows who he has been in dialogue with on social media and the people amplifying his message. And really, more implicitly, he's saying that these are our people, as in this is now the core of the Republican Party, which is something that Paul Ryan seems to be loath to admit or to recognize. And uh, it's really a kind of statement of terms. You know, these are my people. Uh, and, you know, he's the president. He's a Republican. And, I mean, they issue some statements condemning the protesters, condemning the neo-Nazis, the Republican leadership. But as a whole, the party decides to move on from that moment. What do you take from that decision? How important was that? By the time we get to Charlottesville, it's almost predictable uh, that the party uh, has made the bargain that it has made and that it's not going to pursue any more vigorous response to the violence and the white nationalist appeals that you saw being made in Charlottesville. They do deploy Tim Scott, Senator Tim Scott, African-American uh, from South Carolina, uh, for some sort of sensitivity training with Donald Trump, uh, which is you know, almost entirely uh, for media consumption. Uh, but from there, they pivot on. You know, they are uh, 
uh, attempting to kind of move on to their achieving their goals. They have control of both houses of Congress and the presidency. Uh, there's really no reason uh, to their mind, no political advantage uh, to dwelling on what happens in Charlottesville. What do you make of the stories that some people do object? They are attacked by Trump. They lose primaries. They're sort of pushed out of the party. I mean, what do you make of that conflict inside the story of American democracy, of where the Republican Party is going? It's really not that shocking when you see, uh, you know, some Republicans uh, who raise alarms, take issue uh, with Trump and Trumpism, uh, and get pushed out of the party as a consequence in American history. Whenever parties have gone through the kind of seismic changes that you see happening in 2016, well, 2016 through 2020, uh, there are always individuals who can't reconcile themselves to it, the people who can't abide with, you know, what the new marching orders are. And, you know, that's more likely than not. The more notable thing here is that so much of the party remains loyal, uh, that you don't have mass defections uh, from the, the party because of what Trump is and what he represents, uh, that the never-Trumpers are vastly outnumbered by the always-Trumpers. Uh, and for the individuals who get primaried, you know, the individuals who get, you know, personally attacked, or he tweets about them, and they're embarrassed, or they suffer in their fundraising, uh, and those kinds of things, that's kind of the cost of doing business. The Democrats try to impeach Trump. They're not able to succeed at it. And so at first, I was just wanted to ask you about the sort of Democrat side in establishing the polarization that's going on between these two parties. Was America, as you watch it, was it becoming so, more polarized? So one of the things that really defined certainly the early period of Trump's presidency uh, was the fact that you know, Democrats did not expect him to win, you know, any more than like most Republicans did, you know. But for Republicans, they never really had to figure out how to govern as a result of that. They just went along with, you know, what Trump was doing. And maybe that was a, a moral decision, but it wasn't a tactical and a strategic one. Uh, for Democrats, they had to figure out how to navigate this landscape in which the most vile, misogynistic, xenophobic, racist, uh, violent, volatile elements of his rhetoric and his campaign uh, posture were okay with 60 million people. And so where does that leave you? It was very difficult for them to figure out what they would be outside of opposing, simply opposing Donald Trump. And into that vacuum uh, came a kind of perpetual outrage system. Uh, the hyper examination of everything that he did uh, that was outside of the norm uh, or that was potentially a conflict of interest or that was you know, potentially dangerous in national or international affairs. Uh, and you, know, you saw culturally you know, this being taken up by late night television hosts and comedians and those sorts of things, but none of which translated into an effective counter strategy for dealing with Trump in the White House. Uh, and so, especially for those first two years, uh, it's really racked by this question of who they are and what they should be. You know, one part of the party uh, thinks that the party has to remain uh, a kind of centrist, moderate, liberal uh, entity. And another part of it thinks that the only way to beat Donald Trump is to move as far to the left as he has taken the Republican Party to the right. Uh, and so, you know, that is being hashed out, a battle that's being fought <laughs> in that time period between 2016 and 2018 uh, to try to decide what it is that they should do. And they eventually decide whether it's political necessity or they have to, or the moment that they're going to impeach the president and it's the first impeachment. And the result is this highly polarized moment. None of the House Republicans, including Liz Cheney and others who would later turn on the president, support it. Only Mitt Romney does in the Senate. He ends up being acquitted. When you look at the story of American democracy of whether you can hold the president in check 
What does that first impeachment reveal about American democracy? So the first impeachment of Donald Trump reveals something that we probably should have already known about American democracy, uh, a particular weakness of American democracy, but like lots of things, like lots of weaknesses, uh, almost if you think of them as you know stress fractures, uh, a lot of these stress fractures would never be noticed uh, in kind of normal circumstances uh, until you have someone like Donald Trump who highlights that vulnerability. That being said, Presidents have never faced a credible threat of uh, impeachment, or certainly not conviction, uh, when their own parties controlled Congress. Uh, and this has only been something uh, that has been deployed by members of the opposing party. Uh, and even you know, with Nixon, uh, it was the threat that Democrats would impeach and potentially convict him. And so the fact that Democrats, uh, by the time that Trump was impeached, did have a majority, but they didn't have enough of a majority to convict him in the Senate, should have almost been a foregone conclusion, uh, given that you know, what he did was egregious and incredible and shocking to the sensibilities and you know, met the definitions of the letter uh, in the Federalist Papers for what impeachment, uh, what kinds of acts should generate impeachment. But the political reality was always that there was very little chance that he was going to be convicted, no matter what he did, because Democrats did not have a two-thirds majority in the Senate. For all his reputation in American politics and maybe in American society, impeachment has always been a fairly toothless solution to a presidency that's out of control. I guess to the extent that there was a threat, it was just to have been impeached would be a black letter. And now he is acquitted. And what message does that would that send to somebody like Donald Trump? What message does that send about the checks and balances at that moment when he holds up the paper and he's sort of celebrating his acquittal as, as a victory? You know, after the acquittal and the impeachment uh, trial, there's really a kind of divided sense uh, there are people who are hopeful, uh, who express hope that he will be chastened by the experience. That's not really Susan Collins, you know, being you know primary among them. Uh, I don't think that's the prevailing sensibility. Generally speaking, uh, this is seen as something that will embolden him uh, because if he could strong arm a foreign nation. Uh, into being part in, of the American presidential election, hoping to discredit uh, a potential opponent, and that doesn't result in him being pushed out of office, it becomes a question of whether anything will. And in a bigger sense, there's a kind of theme in Trump's life. Yeah, he had always been able to flout the rules uh, he had always been able to get around things. When uh, the New York Times published his uh, tax returns, he saw that uh, for years and years, uh, he had been able to operate in ways that seemed to be contravening American tax law and suffered no consequences for it. Each time, that seemingly emboldened him to do more of the same. And so the acquittal and the impeachment trial really just fit into this bigger pattern uh, in which he became more audacious and more contemptuous of the rules uh, that other people had to abide by uh, and more confirmed in the belief that those normal rules did not apply to him. What's his response to George Floyd? The whole nation saw this man's life extinguished over the course of nine excruciating minutes. And that was an indictment of the system. It was an indictment of the society. It was an indictment of all the dynamics that made it possible, even probable, that something like that would happen. And Trump's reaction was to offer the same sort of response that he offered about protesters at his rallies, which is to crack down on them 
uh, to use violent force, to not actually think about the moral argument that people are making or the, the position people are taking, but to use force. There, there's no, nowhere in there is there, in, in Trump's response, is there any recognition of, of the moral weight of what happened? I mean, I think you're right, because it's like, and it, it may not even matter what his own personal response is. It's what does he do as the president of the United States and how does he respond? And, and obviously, his response is not in solidarity with the protesters or with people who are saying we have to, to learn from this moment. Or empathy. It wasn't in solidarity with empathy or any of... This was like an international in, indictment. Like the whole world saw what American police do at least in that moment. And there was no recognition that the moral authority of the country had been damaged by that video, or the fact that it happened, or the fact that there was a lineage of these kinds of actions that connected to that moment. None of that. You know, what we saw was the most simplistic, ham-fisted, crack down, uh, bring in the military helicopters, uh, you know, implicitly threatening the lives of protesters. You know, just nothing that, that conveyed any sense of leadership, like the understanding of the problem beyond use of force. He talks about Antifa, the radical left, agitators. There's a political rhetoric of an us versus them rhetoric that he's using, that the enemies are, you know, the radical left or Antifa are the protesters in the streets. He seems to be inflaming it. What is he doing when he's using language like that? Traditionally, presidents have at least deployed the rhetoric of unifying the country. And that was something that was not central to Trump's political rhetoric. Um, because his strength was derived from weaponizing the grievances that one part of the country had about other parts of the country. And so in a moment like that, that desperately called for someone being able to stand above the fray, the only thing that Trump was capable of doing was getting into the fray and inflaming it even further. And that was evidenced by his reaction to what happened. Um, it was evidenced by his fallback, you know, not talking about the fact that regular, fairly apolitical American citizens saw that video and were sickened by it. His rhetoric went to trotting out the familiar sources of contempt. You know, this is about Antifa. Uh, you know, this is about the radical left. Uh, you know, this is about uh, you know, the people who you already hate and think want to destroy the country. And in the midst of that, there was really no mechanism for the country to navigate. There was no path for the country to navigate its way to anything resembling reconciliation. Let me ask you this, because the enemy, right, Antifa, the radical left, and in terms, even compared to 2016, of an existential threat faced by the other side. I mean, what does that do for democracy? What does that do to a country that has elections and you know results of elections? What is that kind of rhetoric that you see in that moment does it pose a threat to democracy? The, so the belief in democracy, at least in a partisan democracy, uh, is that your group represents the best interests of the society. At the very least, they represent your best interests. Uh, but you have the best ideas and that you're going to move the society um, forward. But your ability to, ability to do that is dependent upon you convincing other people that you have the best ideas. And that your opponent, at least in theory, uh, has ideas that you disagree with 
but they are also trying to move in the best direction of the broader society. That's a healthy kind of democratic compact. What we've seen increasingly in the United States has been a variation of that, wherein your opponents not only have bad ideas, but they are operating in bad faith. And if left to their own devices, will generate not only bad outcomes, but existentially bad outcomes. And so in his campaign rhetoric, Trump would often use a phrase that, you know, if this happens, we won't have a country anymore. Uh, and there were always these, these different contingencies. Uh, if we don't stop the illegal immigration into the country, we won't have a country anymore. Uh, or if we don't stop Antifa, if we don't stop, there's always a fearsome element that threatened the continued existence of the United States. Now, of course, the irony is that, you know, kind of taking the line from FDR, uh, what you should be fearful of is that level of fear, the, of the ability to be manipulated in that way, of the ability to think that uh, these other people who pay taxes to the same government that you do, that serve in the same military that you do, that uh, vote in the same elections that you do, that these people, as opposed to being citizens who understand politics differently, are actually some sort of nefarious element trying to destroy the country. And it's the rhetoric that was deployed against communists during the Cold War uh, or against Nazis in World War II. Uh, and it's being deployed internally. That, you know, America's continued ability to stand as this shining city on the hill is dependent upon us defeating this enemy, uh, except that this enemy also happens to be someone who might live next door to you. That's extremely dangerous for democracy. The phrase he issues in a tweet, he says, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. I mean, he says, oh, I didn't know the history. Well, what is he tapping into? What does it reveal about American democracy for a president of the United States, to use that phrase? Trump had run on uh, this kind of rehabilitated rhetoric of law and order. Uh, and it was never quite clear what that meant. And it didn't have to be. You know, he was running at the time of at a time of historically low crime, but he had cultivated a sense of panic uh, among his following, such that in saying that you would provide law and order, uh, he appeared to be a kind of savior. You know, saving people from a problem that really wasn't that prominent in the first place. But you know, nobody is reading the fine print on this. And so, when you have something like the unprecedented surge of protests that you saw in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, he went back to the thing that he knew. You know, when the looting starts, the shooting starts, uh, meaning that uh, they would not hesitate to use lethal force in the protection of property, Oblivious to the fact that this was a conflict that was created by the use of lethal force in the first place. But again, people weren't reading the fine print. And so that language only further certified uh, in the minds of his followers and kind of um, the like-minded that there would be violence necessary to subdue uh, these people who they disagreed with uh, on the other part of the political spectrum. When you see the protesters cleared out from in front of the White House, and the president walks out, and holds up a Bible. You know, at that same time, there's the helicopters hovering over protesters in, in Washington. There's images from around the country. When you see that scene, what does it say about the state of American democracy, that demonstration that the president does? The thing, the interesting thing here is that there's really no protest um, that I can think of 
that represents as big a threat as the president of the United States calling in a military helicopter to break it up, especially a nonviolent protest as this protest was. But even outside of that, the deployment of military hardware by the president of the United States in Washington, D.C., lends itself to all sorts of authoritarian implications. This is not calling out the National Guard. <laughs> this is not uh, you know, the local police. This is a sense that we're walking right up to the line of military suppression of dissent. And I think that, you know, one of the things that people noticed was that that event happened uh, right around the anniversary of Tiananmen Square. And had you been able in 1989 to miraculously show people the images of Washington, D.C. in 2020, no one would believe that that was happening in the United States. They would say, oh, these are images of you know, the authoritarian Chinese government. Um, but the parallels were very easy to see in those two instances. And yet, there's not even the kinds of statements that we saw after Charlottesville. In fact, there's you know Tom Cotton's editorial about sending the troops. There's a lionization of Kyle Rittenhouse. The couple from St. Louis is right. invited to the to the convention. Right. I mean, where is the Republican Party ended up by 2020 on the scale of democracy and authoritarianism? Where are they? Going into the 2020 election, especially is notable, you know, that there is like very little soul searching um, that, you know, around the question of how is it that you have uh, an American citizen asphyxiated for nine minutes uh, on the street of a major American city. And, you know, the energy is, is around people who were contemptuous of the protesters. Um, that's who we see lionized on the right. Uh, we see this immediate attempt to posthumously discredit George Floyd uh, as if he had made any statement other than to beg for his life. Uh, and so by that point, the party is pretty close to meeting the definitions of authoritarianism, or at least tolerating um, the authoritarianism of the president. Uh, and you know, this is something that people begin noticing. You know, notably, American democracy uh, is downgraded on all the international indexes that measure like how free societies are or how authoritarian the governments are, uh, you know, we begin to see the United States uh, sliding on that scale in the course of these years. Uh, and this is almost directly a product of uh, the kinds of dictatorial behaviors we see being tolerated uh, by the Republican Party uh, when it comes to Donald Trump. So Let's go to the period after the election. We've talked a little bit about that initial choice that the Republican Party made. And one of the key people who makes a decision about how to respond is Mitch McConnell, who gives no credit to the claims of fraud or that Donald Trump won the election, but who decides that he's going to remain silent until the middle of December. What are the implications of that decision that a Mitch McConnell makes to remain silent? Well, there are two things that happen. You know, one, that decision keeps Mitch McConnell out of the crosshairs of Trump and Trump's people. Um, but more perniciously, uh, that gives a lead time uh, for the most fantastic and outrageous conspiratorial ideas to really just start circulating. Uh, and for any of the official elements of the kind of Republican establishment uh, who have some capacity to blunt that, you know, it's, it's questionable whether or not they could even stop it at that point, uh, because 
you know, Trump's grasp uh, on the party had metastasized to such a degree at that point. But the fact of it is that most don't even try. And these ideas begin circulating, you know, in the, the body politic unchecked. And in that same period, too, you're seeing there's marches where that had turned violent in places. This is before January 6th. This is in November and December. There's threats to local election officials. There are threats to even members of Congress who are Republicans who've spoken up against what the president is saying. Is it surprising to see violence in that period as the lie about the election is spreading? By the time the returns come in uh, and it becomes clear that Joe Biden has won the election, it would have been surprising had you not seen violence. Everything had led to a moment wherein Trump's people were completely unmotivated to accept anything other than unqualified victory as valid. And if, in fact, this is an invalid election and the people who are claiming power represent an existential threat to the nation, then why wouldn't you commit acts of violence to defend the country? And we'd seen, you know, this word patriot used in a very strategic sense. You know, people on the right and on the far right had been using the word patriot to describe people who agree with them. And by implication, the anti-patriotism or subversion of people who were on the other side of the political spectrum. And so, here we are, uh, none of these people in this crowd believe that the election was legitimate, and they have been given an increasingly defined sense of targets. These are people in the Republican Party who have conceded that Joe Biden won. These are administrators. Uh, these are people who, volunteers who worked the polls uh, during uh, the election in, in key places, you know, Atlanta, Philadelphia, uh, Milwaukee. Uh, and these are Republican, in some instances, Republican secretaries of state who want to certify uh, elections uh, in which Joe Biden won, especially in Georgia and Arizona. Uh, places that the Republican Party thought that they would have at least strong a strong chance of winning. All of these targets are there. Uh, and in what world would there not have been violence directed at these people, or at least the threats of violence? Liz Cheney ends up on one side, and she's going to go against the president, and Kevin McCarthy is going to go along with the president. What is the implications of, of two political leaders reaching different conclusions about how to respond to these claims of a stolen election. I think that, you know, it's important to ground the fact that, you know, Liz Cheney was very much a Republican conservative in good standing, uh, you know, prior to, you know, this moment. And she takes a different position uh, post November 2020 from Kevin McCarthy, who himself you know, flirts with the idea of denouncing uh, Trump's election rigging rhetoric uh, and then quickly backs away from that and reconciles himself, uh, goes to Mar-a-Lago to, to essentially kiss the ring uh, of Trump and, you know, regain his good standing. And Liz Cheney doesn't do that. She goes in the opposite direction. And from the outside, it appears that, you know, there aren't, aren't a ton of policy differences, you know, between the two of them. But what appears to be the key difference is that Cheney recognizes how dangerous this moment is. Not simply for her political prospects or for people who were being uh, yelled at or people who were being threatened, but this is really how societies find themselves enmeshed in protracted bloodshed. Uh, this is how democracies fail. And there's a sense that we are playing with, you know, explosive elements in this. And I'm not sure that other Republicans made that calculation. 
and and not in the sense of you know can we stick it to the Democrats with this, uh, but in the sense of if you discredit the system, this will ultimately be bad for Republicans too. The other person who's in the middle of all of this is Mike Pence, the vice president. And Trump wants him to sort of unilaterally throw out the votes and believes that that's possible. And whether that would be legal or not, people have told us it would have sent the country into protracted chaos. What does that conflict reveal about American democracy between Trump and the vice president? I think one of the things that uh, we have typically thought about American democracy was that uh, it was rooted in, you know, these ironclad precepts of the Constitution, uh, and that it was enshrined in uh, you know, the various parts of election law uh, in the United States, uh, and that there really isn't that much wiggle room, you know, if you wanted to damage the machinery in, in a particular way. Uh, that's wildly untrue. Uh, the fact that Mike Pence didn't have the authority to throw out votes uh, that he, you know, thought were suspicious uh, had nothing to do with Donald Trump's ability to pressure him to do so. And if he made an attempt to do so, the entire system would have found itself at odds uh, and we would have plunged into a constitutional crisis immediately. And what we learn from that is that a good deal of American democracy relies on simple good faith, that the people who are operating the controls of the system will adhere to the norms. But there aren't really checks for a lot of the most dangerous things that could happen in that system. And it only took an intensely self-absorbed, relentlessly ambitious, and politically amoral sensibility like Donald Trump to highlight that fact. But Pence does not go along with it. And he goes out the day of January 6th. And we now know that he's been told this, that people were trying to get into the speech who had weapons, and he tells his supporters to fight like hell. What do you make of that? Is this an American president appealing to a mob over the constitutional process in, in a moment like that? What does it say for the president of the United States to say, you know, we're going to go down to the Capitol, I'm going with you, and we're going to fight like hell? Yeah, I think that this is a, a call to arms. You know, what we saw in that speech on January 6th from Trump was a call to arms you know, from his people. Uh, if you believe that uh, the system is operating you know, as it should, why are you telling people to go there? And what do you want them to do when they get there? Uh, why are you specifically, as we now know, why are you specifically uh, allowing people to keep their weapons? What could reasonably come? At the very least, this is not a prudent decision knowing that these people could potentially uh, commit acts of violence. At the very worst, it's an incitement to a potential coup d'etat. The Republican Party's response, because January 6th happens, the attack happens, in the House, the majority of Republicans still vote to not certify the states. People have told us that some of those members who might have certified were actually afraid of violence towards them. What is the Republican Party's response that day reveal? I think the, the refusal to certify the votes marked an almost final capitulation. It was the end stage surrender, that there was no point at which the danger to democracy would supersede the danger to their own political ambitions uh, or you know, the tolerance for potential physical danger that they might be in. Uh, being mindful, however, that members of Congress vote to send the armed forces uh, into places where they may get killed in defense of the country. 
And so the argument that people were fearful for their own safety doesn't really hold up. The quickest way to, to assure their safety would have been uh, to not run for Congress. But if you hold that office, then you have taken an oath to, op to uphold American democracy. And sometimes that requires risk. But the fact that having seen just how dangerous that moment was, people still gave more oxygen to the canard that the election had been rigged by voting against certification meant that they were either unaware or terminally unconcerned with the potential implications for American democracy. At the end of it, Kevin McCarthy goes to Mar-a-Lago and meets with the president. How important was the decision being made in that moment after January 6th by the Republican Party about how they were going to respond to January 6th, how they were going to, as a party, understand what happened? You know, How, how important was that trip to Mar-a-Lago and what it represented? I think the crucial thing after January 6th you know, was that, you know, first, you know, January 6th had happened on the fly. You know, people didn't know uh, who was going to win the election. They began organizing and plotting for this in the aftermath of Joe Biden winning the election. But the behavior after January 6th was far more significant. And the reason it was far more significant was that it was laying the groundwork well in advance for how the party and how a significant portion of our government would respond to a similar challenge in the future. If there is no real consequence and there's no uh, exile for a political figure who's orchestrated this kind of violence, uh, and this person remains not only within the fold, but still effectively, culturally, the leader of the party, then it only means that it's more likely that given more lead time, likely more resources, more advantages, given what we saw with Republican legislatures uh, passing laws that would facilitate uh, this kind of thing, that we would find ourselves in a moment where we actually did have an election that was determined to have one victor, but in which another person is able to claim power. What is that decision that they're making to eject a Liz Cheney, to eject somebody, to reject somebody who's saying the election wasn't stolen, that January 6th was something that we need to learn from? Yeah, I think the, the decision that people are making um, in kind of tossing Liz Cheney overboard is the decision to continue down the road toward authoritarianism or potential authoritarianism. It becomes that simple. Uh, you know, it's not really in dispute that Joe Biden won the election. But if you can sow confusion in the minds of people and you can use physical force and intimidation uh, and, and witness your colleagues, many but not all of whom are uh, in the, the Democratic Party, having to flee for their lives. And that doesn't suggest the need for a changed behavior. It almost certifies that we will be back in this situation again. So how dangerous is this moment for American democracy? Um, I think that we are in among you know, the most dangerous moments that we've seen in American democracy. Uh, I don't think that it's difficult to make that calculation. I'm not making the argument that, that this would necessarily be expressed by civil war. Um, but when we look at the politics that preceded the American Civil War, uh, you know, we see a kind of narrowing, a, a kind of sorting into irreconcilable, uh, distinct positions. Now, one of those positions in that instance happened to be uh, the moral position that slavery needed to be contained and ultimately abolished. Um, but the politics themselves 
indicate the way that a society uh, finds itself moving toward unthinkable levels of violence. If we look at uh, the Cold War, if we look at World War II or World War I, uh, or the, the War of 1812 even, we don't see you know, the same sort of social polarization and disruption on the scale that we see now. I think this is as dangerous a moment uh, as we have seen.